My mother taught me when I was a young boy that one of the best things that you can say in your life and express in your life is gratitude. So that's the first thing I'm going to do is say thank you for, uh, where's Ann at? There she is, right there. Thank you for inviting me again. I am I'm grateful. And, and to do a, a, a an, you know, to review another dog book. I mean, <laughs> I mean this, this one was, well, we're going to get into this. I'm not going to get off the, the subject. Um, um, so I'll begin. There comes a time in everyone's life when a book expire, inspires you to change in a significant way. Uh, the way you look at life and the way you look at dogs. After caring for dogs for over 46 years, I have had a few none like uh, mutt. <laughs> the Dog Who Wouldn't Be by Farley Moad is such a book for me, and within its pages glows warmth and humor, lots of life and love. Written for people of all ages, Farley Moad draws on his borderline tall tales of adventures, or perhaps I should rather say misadventures, <laughs> with his childhood family dog named Mutt and the Moat family that are indeed hilarious and memorable and will certainly have you falling in love with Mutt again and again and again. I read this book last week. I was telling um, uh, Robert and Jeannie when I uh, I waited. I'm a classic pro procrastinator. Um, I like pressure. I don't know, and some of my sons have picked up that habit, and they're probably better than, than I. Um, I don't recommend it to anyone. Don't be a procrastinator. I read eight chapters one day. That was, that was enough. Let that absorb, and then I read the next, the next eight the, the following day. I waited a day. So just let it absorb. And then the fourth day or third day, I sketched out a, a plan. And then the following day, I wrote, wrote out the, you know, the notes. So that's my, that was my approach. I'm still uh, reflecting on this book. It is in my head and most especially in my heart. So for purposes of this book review, uh, in my time with you today, I will review the following areas, the setting, the characters. I'll do a little bit of literary criticism of the author, of uh, the plot, and then, and then finally share with you a recommendation. First, the setting. The, the misadventures of Farley and Mutt began when the family moved to Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada in 1929. I'm a Texan, I think I said that correctly. Um, a remote frontier town um, on the edge of a prairie that was experiencing the Dust Bowl at the time and was set smack in a landscape that Farley aptly describes on page 14 appeared to be in the last stages of dry rot. Now, We've all seen dry rot, but what an image that thrust right in your face. Um, by the time Farley and his family arrived in Saskatoon, or just outside of Saskatoon, you recall in the book they stopped at a farm to get some help with um, their car or something. And the old farmer began talking with Farley and further, de further described Saskatoon in, in this way. She's flat, boy. This country's flat enough so you can stand on a gopher hill. You can, you can see nigh off to China. <laughs> Saskatoon was founded more than 30 years before Farley and his family arrived as an outpost of the Methodist faith and eventually became a city of over 30,000 people. Saskatoon embraced the beliefs and customs of the Duckabors, the Mennonites, and the Hooterites, all this was a mystery to eight-year-old boy, eight-year-old boy named Farley. 
who hailed from Ontario. Now a little bit about the characters. Now that may be obvious, but I think we need to talk about them. Um, Farley's family consisted of his father, his mother, Farley, and eventually uh, Mutt. Now, I didn't include all the other animals, or all the other extended family, and they count too, uh, but this is where the story centers around. Um, on the one hand, Farley describes his father as a librarian, and he was. Uh, he was also a sailor at heart, an ingenious builder, and a hopeful hunter. Apparently, his father accepted a librarian position. That's the reason why they moved to Saskatoon from our Ontario. It doesn't say why. He was just offered the job, and he accepted it. And um, that explained the purpose of the journey across the lunar landscape of the Saskatchewan prairie. On the other hand, Farley describes his mother as enterprising, frugal, patient, Curious at heart. Farley is the author of the book and also is endowed with a fertile imagination, love of dogs, all animals, the great outdoors, and I dare say a huge giftedness with words. I don't do this very often, and maybe you did this too when you were reading the book, but I had to pull out my Webster's while I was reading the book, because some of these book words I saw in this uh, the book I had not seen before. Contextually, I could figure it out, but I needed to go, what does he mean by that word? We'll talk a little more about that later. Before I introduce Mutt, let me share how Mutt arrived in the Moat household. One day, Far Farley's mother answered the door, and a little boy was standing holding a box full of three emaciated ducks, and a small emaciated cow manure cake puppy. Um, and he asked Farley's mother if she would like to buy some ducks. And she didn't have any place. I don't think she really wanted to buy the ducks, but she used the excuse, I don't have any place to keep ducks. And, but she did notice the puppy. And she purchased the puppy for four cents. As soon as the Moat family arrived in their new rent house in Saskatoon, which became their home that Farley, Farley describes as, quote, an incinerator in the summer and a polar outpost in the winter. <laughs> yeah, it does sound like San Antonio, doesn't it? Farley realized that the family did not have a dog to join them on the new adventure, so Farley's father, at the encouragement of great, um, the, uh, where's my note? Great Uncle Frank um, began looking for a hunting dog and brought home an Irish sitter, uh, a beautiful Irish sitter. You recall this story. Um, he loved the dog, but there was something about the dog that got the mother's attention, and that was the fact the dog cost $200. Well, you imagine $200 in 1929. Good Lord, that's a lot of money. Remember I described the mother as what? As frugal. Yeah, so she has an underlying motive here with her, her husband. And that was, and timing matters too. So she introduced the puppy to, um, uh, to the family, to the fa her husband and to Farley. And Farley connected immediately with the puppy uh, while Farley connected immediately with the puppy, Farley's father wasn't as receptive. Why? Because, well, the little dog, the little puppy didn't look like, you know, a hunting dog as he was, you know, look for, looking forward to buy. So Farley's mother and her alter, ulterior motive for buying the puppy, that saving the family some money, won over her husband and Mutt became a member of the Moat household. So how did Farley describe his new puppy, Mutt? Well, at first, Farley believed that Mutt was never really a puppy. And what does he mean by that? He did not do the things that puppies normally do, like chew on your foot, chew on the upholstery, uh, maybe stain the, the rugs. No, Mutt was different. Mutt was mature 
for his age. He was restrained, dignified, and resolute. He took life seriously and expected everyone around him to do the same. His character was unmalleable, yet he was a complainer. He loved to argue with human beings. He was stubborn and often sulky. Farley believed Mutt no longer believed he was dog, a dog, yet neither did Mutt believe he was a human. In appearance, Mutt was unique like his attitude. His hindquarters were elevated a little higher than his forequarters, and at the same time, he was distinctly canted from left to right. And as a result, he used this drifting off three points to starboard to his advantage when chasing gophers and cats. They never really knew if he was really chasing them because it looked like he was going to turn left or was it right until it was too late and he was on the cat or the gopher. In addition, Mutt possessed uh, a beautiful coat of hair. Quote, Farley describes Mutt as having a handsome black and white coat of fine, almost silky hair with exceptionally long feathers on his legs. His tail was limber, it was long, it was expressive. His ears were large and limp and his head was broad and high domed and a black mask covered his entire face with his bulbous nose. Remember that adjective was used regularly to describe that nose. That's, that's important to note for a dog. Um, an interesting quality, Mutt also would feign deafness. Farley writes, we could not really take effective steps to cure him of this irritating habit, for it was one he shared with my paternal grandfather. Grandfather was stone deaf to anything that involved effort on his part, yet he could hear and respond to the word whiskey. If it was whispered inside a locked bathroom three floors above the chair in which he habitually sat. Consequently, Mutt did not approve of anyone, especially Farley's father, yelling at him. And that happened a few times. Or loud sounds, such as thunder during a storm. Farley also described Mutt as um, a cat hater, uh, a skunk baiter, a ladder scaler, and, and also an extraordinary retriever that learned to be a retriever after failing a few times, yet he carried with him the aura of a Don Quixote. Clearly, as Farley put it, Mutt was not a typical dog and was not an easy dog to live with in the Moat household, and Mutt made certain everyone was his companion on his confused, stubborn journey of life. So that's the characters, the setting and the characters. And now a little bit of um, what I call literary criticism of the author. Farley is a gifted writer. Uh, that book is some 70 years old, and it shows why it's, uh, it's, it's stood the test of time. And he clearly and uses this gift in this wonderful book. His writing style is heartwarming personal, descriptive, and as I said before, hilarious. He is an excellent storyteller. I want to share with you, I shared one little snippet with you, but I want to share some others with you. Do you remember earlier, my mention earlier of Mutt's desire not to be a dog, but to be a human? Apparently, as Farley puts it, Mutt was somehow able to communicate this conviction to onlookers, and so in the book, on page 23, is a cute little story about Mutt and Farley's mother. One bitterly cold day in January, Mother went downtown to do some post-Christmas shopping, and Mutt accompanied her. She parted from him outside the Hudson Bay Department Store, for Mutt had strong antipathies even in those early months, and one of these was directed against the famous company of, of gentlemen adventurers, Mother was inside the store for almost an hour while Mutt was le left to shiver on the windswept pavement. 
When Mother emerged at last, Mud had forgotten that he had voluntarily elected to remain outside. Instead, he was nursing a grievance at what seemed to him to be a calculated indifference to his comfort on my mother's part. He had decided to sulk. And when he sulked, he became intractable. Nothing that mother would say could persuade him to get off the frigid concrete and accompany her home. Mother pleaded. Mud ignored her and fixed his gaze upon the steamed up windows of the Star Cafe across the street. Neither of them was aware of the small audience which had formed around them. There were three duckabores in the quaint winter costumes, a policeman enveloped in a buffalo skin coat, and a dentist from the nearby medical arts building. Despite the cold, these strangers stood and watched with growing fascination as mother ordered in mud with slightly lifted lip and sotto uh, Voss mutters had adamantly refused to heed. Both of them were becoming exasperated, and the tone of their utterances grew increasingly vehement. It was at this point that the dentist lost touch with reality. He stepped forward and addressed Mutt in man-to-man -to -man tones. Oh, I say, old boy, be reasonable, he said reproachfully. Mutt replied with a murmur of guttural disdain, and this was too much for the policeman. What seems to be the matter here? he asked. Mother explained he won't go home. He just won't go. The policeman was a man of action. He wagged his mitt and paw under Mutt's nose. Can't you see the lady's cold, he asked sternly. Mutt rolled his eyes and yawned, and the policeman lost his temper. Now see here, he cried. You just move along, or by the gods, I'll run you in. It was fortunate that my father and Erdley, whom we'll talk about, Shortly, came by at this moment. Father had seen Mutt and Mother in arguments before, and he acted with dispatch. Picking them up almost boldly and pushing them in Erdley's front seat, he did not linger, for he had no desire to be a witness to the reactions of the big policeman and of the dentist. When they became aware of the fact that they had been arguing with a dog <laughs> upon a public street. <laughs> Here's another example. Mutt apparently was a pacifist. He was non-violent. He did not desire to fight, uh, yet he was no coward. Another little story that I thought was, uh, was just, just fabulous. Well, beginning on page 87, despite his repugnance toward fighting, Mutt was no coward, nor was, it, was he unable to defend himself. He had his own ideas about how to fight, ideas which were unique but formidable. Just how efficacious they actually were was demonstrated to us all within a week of our arrival at our new address. Knowing nothing of the neighborhood, Mutt dared to go where even bulldogs feared to tra tread, and one morning he foolishly uh, pursued a cat into the ex school teacher's yard. He was immediately surrounded by four ravening huskies. They were a merciless lot, and they closed in for the kill. Mutt saw at once that this time he would have to fight, so with one quick motion he flung, flung himself over on his back and began to pat, pedal furiously with all four feet. It looked rather as if he were riding a, a bicycle built for two, but upside down. He also began to sound his siren. This was a noise he made, just how I do not know, deep in the back of his throat. It was a kind of frenzied wail. The siren rose in pitch and volume as his legs increased their RPM until they began to sound like a gas turbine at full throttle. The effect of this unorthodox behavior on the four huskies was to bring them to an abrupt halt. Their ears went forward and their tails uncurled as a look of pain, bewilderment wrinkled their brows and then slowly, one by one, they began to back away, their eyes uneasily averted from the distressing spectacle before them, when they were 10 feet from Mutt, they turned as one dog and fled without dignity for their own backyard. The mere sight of Mutt's bicycle tactics, as we referred to them, were usually sufficient to avert bloodshed. But on occasion, a foolhardy dog would refuse to be intimidated. The results in these cases could be rather frightful, for Mutt's queer posture of defense was not all empty bombast. 
In addition, Mutt was also skilled at walking fences. Now, when I came upon this story, I had to pause and reread this. I could not believe this. And I tried to recall in my life ever seeing a dog trying to walk a fence line like a cat, you know? So a little snippet, it, it continues. Um, had he been willing to engage, I'm on page 88, deliberately in a few such duels with the neighborhood dogs, Mutt would undoubtedly have won their quick acceptance, but such was his belief in the principles of nonviolence. As those applied to other dogs, at least, that he continued to avoid combat. The local packs, and particularly the one led by the bull terror, terrier next door, spared no pains to bring him to battle, and for some time he was forced to stay very close to home, unless he was accompanied by mother or by myself. It was nearly a month before he found a solution to this problem, and the solution he eventually adopted was typical of it. Almost all the backyards in Saskatoon were fenced with vertical planking nailed to horizontal two by fours. The upper two by four in each case was usually five or six feet above the ground. So he's describing in detail. So your picture is, you know, in your head is forming. And about five inches below the projecting tops of the upright planks, for generations, these elevated gangways had provided a safe thoroughfare for cats. But one fine day, Mutt decided that they could serve him too. I was brushing my teeth after breakfast when I heard Mutt give a yelp of pain, and at once I went to the window and looked out. I was in time to see him laboriously clamber up our back fence from a garbage pail that stood by the yard gate. As I watched, he wobbled a few steps along the upper two-by-four, lost his balance and fell off. Undaunted, he returned at once to the garbage pail and tried again. So he tries to reason with it. It doesn't work. He's stubborn, remember. So along later in the story, I'll, um, he's, he's encountering the Huskies again, or he's been encountered by the Huskies. And I'll pick up where, on page 90, where uh, Mutt responds to the Huskies by, uh, as Farley writes, Mutt never hesitated. He ambled along his aerial, aerial route with leisurely and sauciance of the old gentleman out for an evening stroll. He's walking on the fence line. The Huskies must have been wild with frustration, and I was grateful that the fence lay between them and us. We three boys, there's three uh, boys witnessing uh, Farley and his friends, had not recovered from our initial surprise when a new canine contingent arrived upon the scene. It included six or seven of the local dogs, of course headed by the bull terrier. Attracted to the scene by the yammering of the huskies, they spotted Mutt and the terrier immediately led a mass assault. He launched himself against the fence with such foolhardy violence that only a bull terrier could have survived the impact. We were somewhat intimidated by the frenzy of all those dogs and we lowered our spears for the ready position, undecided whether to accept Mutt's rescue or not. In the event we were not heeded, Mutt remained unperturbed. Although this may have been only an illusion resulting from the fact that he was concentrating so hard on his balancing act that he could spare no attention for his assailants, he moved along at a slow but steady pace, and having safely navigated the Husky's fence, he jumped up slightly jumped up to the slightly higher fence next door, stepped along it until he came to a garage. With a graceful leap, he gained the garage roof where he lay down for a few moments to rest, but actually I'm certain to enjoy his triumph. <laughs> Below him there was pandemonium. I've never seen a dog so angry as that bull terrier was. Although the garage wall facing on the alley was a good eight feet high, that terrier kept hurling himself impotently against it until he must have been one large quivering bruise. Mutt watched the performance for about two or three minutes, then he stood up and with one insolent backward glance jumped down to the dividing fence between the two houses and ambled along it to the street front beyond. <laughs> hmm. He used the skill of walking fences against the cats in the neighborhood. And uh, Farley writes, Mutt's at all, uh, on page 93, Mutt had always disliked cats until he became an expert fence walker, but he had never been able to demonstrate his feelings 
in a truly efficient manner. The fenced-in backyards of Saskatoon might have been built to order for the cats and specifically designed to thwart all dogs. Perhaps as a result of this favorable environment, the cat population was, was rather large and the cats themselves had grown careless and arrogant. It was understandable that they should feel this way, and after many years of security, it was a foolhardy attitude, as Mutt soon demonstrated. Once he had perfected the art of fence walking, he became the scourge, and often the nemesis of the cats on our block. When the surviving local cats became a few in number and wary, Mutt went farther afield, scouring alleys right across Saskatoon for cats that had not had warning of his unique abilities. Before the year was out, he had endangered such a feeling of insecurity among the city's cats that they became almost wholly arboreal. Once having located the cat, Mutt would make the, the usual futile sort of dog rush in its direction. The cat would promptly climb to the nearest fit, fence and set their feeling ease and, at, and safe. With a dejected look, Mutt would turn away, apparently accepting defeat, while the cat spat insults at his retreating back. But having reached a corner of the fence, Mutt would turn subtly and with a great lead gain the top two by four. Oh, the game changes now. Before the startled cat had time to stand its hair on end, Mutt would come rushing toward it on its own level. And Mutt did this again and again <laughs> and again. And going beyond that, walking fences ultimately to climbing trees and ladders. I was flabbergasted by the time I was reading this. I don't know about you. I, I don't ever recall seeing a dog. I remember seeing goats in trees, but not dogs. And there's stories that I won't, I won't share with you. It's page 94. There's one on 99 that I think was very good um, about Mutt finding a tempting ladder. Uh, he ascended it and being able to turn around simply clambered into an open second door story bedroom window and scratched at the closet bedroom door until the householder came upstairs and let him out. The owner of that house was an, another singular character. He had worked for the Canadian National Railways for 30 odd years and as a result he was the most uh, phlegmatic man I ever knew. Nothing could disturb him and his peace. When he re-entered his living room after having let Mud out the back door, his wife asked him what the noise upstairs had been, and he replied, Oh, nothing, my dear, only a stray dog in the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoyable. Moreover, as an author, Farley enjoyed using two literary devices in writing this book. First, he used quite a bit of um, alliteration. Alliteration is where an author repeats the same sound at the beginning of several words. An example from chapter one, and you recall when he was talking about the great uncle Frank, um, Farley refers to his father and he says, my father determined to test those tales. That's an example of alliteration. Perhaps you can think of others in the book. Here's another, uh, another uh, tool he used was personification. So here's where we're talking about the car again. Personification is attributing human qualities to something that is not human. From chapter one, quote, a headwind would force Erdly into second gear and even when he would have to strain and boil fur furiously to keep headway on his bulky charge. If you had never read this book, first of all, who is hurt Erdly? Would you have known it was a car or a human being by that personification description? Hmm. It was the Moat's Model T convertible. If you, um, by the way, did you know that the Model A Ford was made from 1927 to 1932, a very popular car at that time? Prices ranged from $385 for a Roadster to $1,400 for the top of the line town car. A lot of money in those days. Fourth, the plot of the book. The plot of the book is the heartfelt and hilarious story of M Farley's youthful adventures with his companion, Mutt, who wouldn't be a dog, nor would he be a human. Hmm. Mutt became way more than a dog. He became a hunting dog in a genius way after learning from failure, learning to ride and early, um, 
one of my favorite, I think this is my very favorite description of early. It's on page 145, and it's in the chapter called Vignettes of Travel when the Moat family is traveling around. And they're leaving the, the mountains uh, temporarily and descending into this valley. And um, they were hungry, and, and, and they came upon uh, some fruit. And that's all they ate. That's all that Mutt shared with them. He shared their appetites. He had peaches, muskmelon, cherries. But cherries were his, undoubt, his undoubted favorites. Farley writes, at first he had trouble with the pits, but soon perfected, listen to this, a rather disgusting trick of squirting them out between his front teeth, away from us and the car he was, uh, whenever he was eating the cherries. I shall never forget the baleful quality of the look directed at mud by a passenger on the little ferry in which we crossed the Okmagan River. Perhaps the, book was, the look was justified. Certainly, Mutt was a quaint spectacle as he sat in the rumble seat of Erdley, his goggles pushed far up on his forehead, eating cherries out of a six-quart basket. <laughs> After each cherry, he would raise his muzzle, point it overside, and nonchalantly spit the pit into the green waters of the river. Oh, my goodness. Or he perused with owls, and you remember the two owls. Part of, that was part of the book that was my uh, favorite. Uh, didn't have too many owls up in the Texas Pando. There are owls around these parts. So, you know, I was always spooked by owls, but, uh, you know, it's really great to read those stories, the geese, the cows, the ducks, and even fishing for crawfish and frogs. You remember that, that portion, too. Mutt was always full of surprises and led a life of Farley that only a, uh, a few could ever imagine, filled with warmth, humor, and lots of love. But the climax of the book is the very, be the very best chapter is the last chapter. Uh, chapter 16, appropriately titled April Passage. In this chapter, Farley sums up his life with his best friend in the following way. It's found on page 200 and... 16. Farley had sat down to breakfast and he had glanced out the kitchen window and I, he could see uh, Moat moving slowly down the road toward the pond. I knew he had gone to see about those ducks and when the meal was done I put on my rubber boots, picked up my field glasses and followed after. The country road was silver with runnels of thaw water and bronzed by the sliding ridges of the melting ruts. There was no other wanderer on that road, yet I was not alone, for his tracks went with me. Each paw print as familiar as the print of my own hand. I followed them, and I knew each thing that he had done, each move that he had made, each thought that had been his, for it is with two who live one life together. Farley sums up his book on page 220 with the following words. After discovering that his friend was run over by a fast-moving truck. Didn't spend a whole lot of time describing that because I'm guessing it was very hard for him to, um, you know, discuss, discuss that. Um, last page. The pact of timelessness between the two of us was ended, and I went from him into the darkening tunnel of the years. I highly recommend this book. Um, some say it's written for children, but I say it's written for all ages of God's children. It is a masterfully written, memorable biography of an extraordinary dog with an extraordinary boy named Farley that has stood the test of time, and in my opinion, will continue to do so when I read this book to my grandchildren someday, and then for years to come. Thank you. Do you have any questions about the book? What did you think he meant by 
the pact of timelessness at the end? Well, as a pastor, what connection do you think this has to uh, the hope for eternal life, maybe the hope for it's a good question. eternal uh, existence and being in the presence of God? You know, You're referring to that last, yeah, that last, that last, that last uh, uh, passage. Yeah. I, I think both those, those statements that I pulled from you know, from the chapter, you know, living life together and, um, you know, you get so close to someone, you love them, you know, so much that, you know, what's the, the, the words or phrases that are said, you know, I know what they're going to say in this situation. In fact, I can, I can complete their, their, their sentence and then suddenly, you know, not not long after all that idyllic beauty that he was describing. I mean, if you you remember the chapter, I mean, it's just like it's the glories of God's creation, and then all of a sudden, this tragic thing happened. And you know, while Farley didn't know it at the time, he knew later, of course, as he wrote. Um, you know, the moment he lost his friend. Um, you know, his, his life changed. But, you know, th there, you know, he describes, the, the last words he describes was, you know, the pact of timelessness. There's, a, there's an eternal uh, quality to, to that. So is he talking about timelessness on earth or timelessness when uh, forever? I think he's talking about timelessness forever and believes one day, you know, because of that love. And this is what I tell my my boys, because you know you get the you get the question. Everyone has their own opinion of this. But, you know, Dad, will we see, you know, one of our dogs in heaven? And I always say, oh, of course. <laughs> you know why I say that? Because of that love. I don't think God um, gives us such opportunities, you know, like he, he gave Farley to have such a unique dog to love and have such unique experiences. Animals te can animals teach us how to love better? <laughs> Come over to my house and have a, a, a piece of cake and some punch. I'll show you two um, <laughs> old chocolate labs, four cats, and a bearded dragon. Now, do the cats and dogs get along? Mostly. But I'll tell you, the bond we have with our dogs and, and animals is a deep one. It really is. And I, I tell the boys, yeah, you will, see, you will see the dogs on the front porch. And that's my way of saying, you know, and that's what I tell all my dogs, you know, before they die, if, you know, none of them have had to, None of them have been run over. I've unfortunately had to have them all put down because of some some reason or another. And it's the it's the thing I despise the most. Um, and some people can't be there with them when that happens. But I choose to, as painful as it is, to be there and hold them because they've spent their entire life out there by my side. So yeah. Uh, and before the vet gives the, the shots, I say, I'll see you on the front porch. <laughs> Even though the dark, the darkening tunnel of the years, almost a reference to grief, you know, of course he was grieving. Good gosh. I mean, to be that close to an animal, you know, he deeply uh, loved. Uh, an author that I read about grief, um, a necessary thing we all have to go through defines grief in this way. It's, it's the natural and uh, necessary sequel to love. The natural and necessary sequel to love. Well, I think that's what, what,
Farley entered into, AKA the darkened tunnel of the years because the light just went out. What's the light? The light of that love and this friendship. Um, on earth, but not in heaven. It's not, it's not over with, so it's not over with. Hope I touched on it enough there. Well, you did. You did such a good job of reviewing it for me who didn't read the book, and I'm looking forward, I'm looking forward to reading it. But uh, that last passage reminded me of one of the greatest gifts of, of life is to, when, when some phase is over, it's not coming back to your life, but you realize that that was a foretaste of eternity. There was something about that phase of your life yeah. that was, uh, yeah. it was, it was a, a vision of forever. You know, like this is, this is it. This is oh, yeah. golden. It, this it'll is never, it. it'll never end. Yeah. I mean, you're that close to, a, well, an animal in this case, or to a person that, as I said, you could finish your words. You know, I mean, you're that. You're that close, and then and then when that ends, it feels like part of you has gone with them. I ask that question to people. I say, "How much of your identity think do you think went with your loved one?" And they never hesitate to say two thirds to three quarters of their own identity. And I go, "Wow, why, why, why do you think that?" Because I love that person. I love that dog so much. So, wow, there was a lot, you know. Uh, there was, during the book, I think it was about the time when Farley started, um, you know, there was a lot of discussion about the owls mm -hmm. and, and those. You didn't hear much mention of mud. Do you remember that? Yeah. It wasn't all, you know, not as much as it was at the beginning or even at the end, but in the middle of the book, he didn't hear him mention Mutt that often, but Mutt, he did insert him. Mutt was always there, so he was always present with him throughout his life. And you know, there's something about that last chapter that never was defined clearly how old was Farley at that time. Almost sound like he was an older guy to you, did you think? Didn't, he, he didn't say how old he was. But his mom and dad weren't there, right? There was no mention of father and mother, it was just him and him and my and the pond. And all those animals, you know, as you mentioned the great horned owl, the rabbit, you know, they're all there. Almost that whole chapter is like they're in heaven. You know. It's perfect. Except they're not. They're not. Or, you know, a fast moving truck wouldn't have hit you know, into his life. I'm glad I didn't talk about that too much because I had memories of losing dogs you know, and ripping my, ripping my heart to pieces. So Susie told me, she said, don't focus on that part, Scott. Don't focus on that. I go, I won't, I won't. I mean, there's too much, but you know, you laugh so much in this book, and then there's the note of, of sadness. And and Farley didn't hesitate to write about the sad part of loving a, a pet, like the owls. Remember the owls, how they, uh, one owl choked itself in a, in a cage, and the other one was shot, uh, was literally shot in the home that they moved from by the next resident. Yeah, it was very tragic because the, the, the owl, whoop, wall, wall thought it was home. And so wall flies into the window, lands, and there's a gun waiting for him. Ends his life. So he didn't hesitate to write about, you know, there's joy and, and lots of laughter and hilarity, but there's also sadness and owning. I mean, it's, it's risky to go on this love side. Pets. I mean, you can either hold it all back and let your heart get hard, or you can toss your heart out there and risk, well, risk, you know, uh, risk it being stepped on. If you're anything like me, I think it's worth risking loving the pet. Because God knows you need that. God doesn't want to leave you standing there or holding you know, stuff. He wants your heart to 
grow. Because that's what he's most concerned about is your heart. The motives of your heart. Your heart developing, growing, growing. Everything else, well, he'll take care of that for as long as he can. So if you read the book, read it again. <laughs> share it with your children, share it with your grandchildren. If you haven't, you can get it as a PDF online, Robert. It's free. Or go buy the book for what was it, fifteen ninety five? I think it's in the library. Oh, it's in the library too. I got that at the library. Well, that's even better. You know, he's written lots and lots of other books. Yeah. And 40, you go on YouTube and see him talking. There are a lot of interviews. Mm -hmm. He's dead since two thousand fourteen, but he became a well known environmentalist, ecologist, oh, yeah. activist. Activist yeah. and uh, had many experiences with many different animals. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it was, I, I don't know if Ann was thinking of this, but I imagine you were, and I'm guessing. Uh, that really ideas with nature, nature and animals. And, uh, I mean, that's right up my alley. <laughs> it really, really is. Uh, that's why we got so many. One, because I love them, and secondly, because I can't say no. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's quite a discrepancy about the two $200 Irish center yeah. and the four cents. Oh, but, oh, yeah. But I was amazed when you told the price of an almond. Yeah. I mean, that was <laughs> only seven times more than the cost of that car. Yeah, Sh shocking. <laughs> What we spend our money on. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, you know, today, uh, three hundred what's three hundred and eighty five dollars? Well, that's a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not any small change, but that compared to buying a, an automobile today for thirty thousand dollars or thirty thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars or whatever, yeah. uh, you know the way the way that the note the note I found about the wrote it is if you really you know if you really want to up it you get the the, the fourteen hundred version of that the fourteen hundred dollar car you know? it's like that is a lot of money you know you had to be wealthy perspective what well, what's your perspective about that time so but the four cents that was a very emphatic point. Uh, you know, what, what well, she only bought it because she didn't want to hurt the little boy's feelings anyway. She right. didn't really want the dog. She didn't need it, didn't wasn't want it. Part of it. No, wasn't part of it. And, and he was only asking five cents. Yeah. And then so she had to bargain with him. The enterprising part. <laughs> you know, she, I, I imagine the, mo the mother sounded to me like uh, she had to put up with a lot. Oh, yeah. A lot. I mean, on the journey on the journey to uh, Saskatoon, I mean, she was mutinous. I think at some point she wanted to leave. I mean, to describe the what's it like to ride in the back of that car with all that dust blowing, you know, the wind. And, yeah, I mean, you smile and get your teeth clean, you know, because the the dirt's blowing so so hard. So, I hope you invite me to. Uh, Review another book someday. Uh, don't hesitate. Don't hesitate, because I'm not going to say. I'm not going to say no. Okay. Thank you all.